that's, that's it. You go to Pathfinder and you go canoe tripping. And uh, when I arrived there as a junior, very junior counselor in June or whatever it was, they gave me a canoe and said, this is your canoe for the summer. Take care of it, fix it up, whatever. And it was a beautiful, well, it was, it was old and well-worn, but it was a chestnut canoe, which we'll talk a little bit about tonight. And I paddled that thing all over Algonquin Park with campers that summer and literally just fell in love with that, with that thing. How old were you? 17, 16, something like that. So you were a counselor in training? Yes. So, um, but I fell in love with that canoe and I said to myself, someday I'm going to, well, it took me 35 years to, to follow up on that, but uh, about 20 years ago, I got my act together and got a shop built out of my home in East Aurora and um, got started, uh, and I've been doing it now for about 20 years, building new cedar canvas canoes, wood canvas canoes, and restoring old ones. So tonight, I want to talk briefly about the history of wood canvas canoes, talk a little bit about the materials that go into them, and then we're going to walk through how you build one. And I, uh, I think what I'd like to ask you to do is hold your questions till the end so I can get through the material I have. And I'll be happy to stay as long as anybody wants to stay to talk about uh, or to answer your questions. So if we, if we think about the history of canoes, probably the very first type of canoe that we can recognize were dugout canoes. And they, they go back thousands of years probably, and were prevalent pretty much all over the world. More or less contemporaneous with them would have been the birch bark or bark canoes that were really, I think, unique to North America. And these were built by the Indians who designed them and exhibit tremendous craftsmanship. This one over here, uh, I think, was built by some students at, at the park school a number of years ago. Yeah, in it's 2000. It's not the finest example of, of a birch bark canoe, but it does tell you a little bit about how one is built. But anyway, these bark canoes were really works of art, and they were specifically designed to support the Native Americans in, in their lifestyle. And they were, they were not only beautiful, but they were extremely functional craft. And they were truly the predecessors of the wood canvas canoe. The wood canvas canoes came on the scene in a big way around 1900, and their heyday, if you will, lasted until about 1960 or maybe even 1970. If you wanted a canoe in that period, chances are the canoe you were going to end up with was a wood canvas canoe, not unlike that red one. That's just, there were, there were solid wood canoes like that little one in the back that were being built, but that's what mostly what people were using. Right at the end of World War II, people like Grumman, who had been building aluminum <coughs> airplanes, said, what are we going to do? The war's over, let's build canoes. And that's, that's where the aluminum canoe market started. Others got into that as well. And of course, shortly after that, we started to see fiberglass, um, any number of synthetic materials right up to the most popular ones now of Kevlar and graphite and everything else. And the, the, the popularity of the wood canvas canoe started to decrease right around the 60s and 70s, because they really couldn't compete with, with the plastic canoes. So the wood canvas canoe really was being developed in the period from about 1870 to about 1900. And, um, and then the main popularity, as I said before, was about 1900 to 1960 or 1970. Um, the bark canoe was truly the, the predecessor of the wood canvas canoe. They look like the bark canoes in shape and in size. They're really very similar in the way they were built. In that, they both feature uh, thin, flexible ribs and thin, flexible planking, which together define the shape of the hull. They both have a tough, waterproof coating around the hull. Birch barks had bark. Canvas canoes, another system which we'll talk about. And then a series of strong rails, uh, gunnels, <coughs> and forts that help maintain the shape of the top part of the canoe. Um, big differences, however, between the two. A, a birch bark canoe is built 
from the outside in. In other words, you start with the skin, with the bark, and you stake it out on the ground, literally, and add the, the top frame with the rails and, and things like that, and then you force ribs down inside and planking. But you start from the outside and work your way in. They were all hand-built. Every canoe was different from every other canoe. They're one of a kind. Um, very slow, very labor-intensive. And in the later years of their popularity, it was getting harder and harder to find good materials, specifically the bark <coughs> um, for good birch trees. The wood canvas canoe, which took over from the bark canoes, is, is different, first of all, in that it's built from the inside out. And we'll walk through that process here in a, in a few minutes. It counts on a solid form, which is what this is down here, to define its shape. It's, it's purposely built so that in this way so that it can be mass produced. And uh, each one is exactly the same as the one that was built on the farm <coughs> right before it. It's a fast construction project, and it doesn't rely on something that's the materials that are hard to get, like bark. So it was the white man's invention, if you will, based on the design and the look and the functionality of the bark canoes, and the wood canvas canoe gradually took over um, and, and replaced the bark canoes, pretty much. Um, that period of 1870 until about 1900, we cannot say definitively who invented this, this wood canvas canoe style of construction. Rather, it's pretty clear that several different small builders were working on various iterations of things which evolved into this, all about the same time, about 1900. And they all were working in Maine, that's pretty clear, and names like Carlton and Morris and Garish and E.M. White these were the small builders who were experimenting with this new style of construction. <coughs> Later on, Rushman, who was over in the Adirondack area, also got into that, into that process. So along about 1900, they got out of what I'll call the developmental phase for wood canvas canoes and into what I'll say is the commercial phase, where the popularity of canoeing in general skyrocketed and the, the demand for inexpensive but durable canoes just skyrocketed. And I'm going to highlight just two canoe, two canoe manufacturers that really took advantage of that. In the U.S., the Old Town Canoe Company in Old Town, Maine, right around 1900, founded that company and they took off like a rocket. They started out in a little one-room shop and within just a few years had a major factory up in Old Town, Maine, with rail lines coming in and centralized steam plants. It was in an enormous camp, and it was only demolished just a few years ago. It lasted a long time. Um, they built hundreds of thousands of canoes in the day, many different models. That's, a, that's an old town right there, the red one. Many different models, many different styles. And in fact, the Old Town name is still in business today. They were purchased by another corporation, I think in the 70s or 80s, but Old Town Canoes are still being made and marketed. They're, they're all plastic <coughs> now or other materials. But if you want a canoe built on the original Old Town forms, there is a builder up in Maine, Jerry Stelmach, who I know many of you know. He has most of the Old Town forms and is under contract to build or Old Town, if you want a canoe like that, and are willing to pay a lot of money for it. <laughs> it can be done. If you're interested in learning more about the Old Town Canoe Company, and it's a great story, uh, there was a fabulous book published by, I, I believe her name is Susan Audet. It's like the definitive work on the Old Town Canoe Company. I don't know if you have one upstairs, but it might be worth adding. Uh, do you know the title of it? Old Town Canoe or something like that. As, as far as I know, as no, know but yes, it's yeah. on our list now. Okay, it's, it's a really good book. I don't have one, but I'd recommend it. Now, at the same time, as Old Town was escalating rapidly into a major corporate enterprise, in Canada, the Chestnut Canoe Company was 
was doing the same thing. And two brothers in Fredericton, New Brunswick, of the Chestnut Brothers, it's not about Chestnut Wood, it's, that was the family name, um, quickly saw that what was happening in the U.S. and they decided they needed to get into the same business in Canada. They recognized that you couldn't import the U.S. canoes into Canada because of uh, financial concerns, and they said, well, we need to build them here, and they did. And they pulled off the greatest coup in canoe building. They somehow managed to get a patent in Canada on the, the method of building the wood canvas canoe, and they squashed all the competition with that, with that packet, patent for many, many years. If you want to read more about them, this one's called <laughs> One the Chestnut Was in Flower, by Roger <laughs> McGregor. It's a great story about the Chestnut Canoe Company, and the, especially some of the lawsuits they went through to <laughs> protect their patent. Uh, they became the largest canoe manufacturer in Canada, competed head-to-head -head with Old Town and, and other builders as well. Um, they closed their doors in the 1970s because they just were driven out of business by the synthetic canoes. Just couldn't, couldn't do it anymore, and they couldn't sell the company, they closed their doors. The form, the building forms, are rumored to be scattered around Canada and used by other builders. I can't verify that, but that's what it's that's what it said. Now I've highlighted just two of the major manufacturers. In truth, there were many, many people building wood canvas canoes. Nobody nearly on the scale of Old Town and Chestnut. What do you think happened to most of them? Hometown bar. Burnt down. <laughs> you know. Fire. <laughs> Fire knocked them out of business. Almost every one of them. And the reason is when you have a factory, and back in the days, these were masonry sort of buildings around the perimeter, low bearing walls inside with timber, posts, and floors, and you fill it up with nice dry cedar. <laughs> No fire protection, no sprinklers. And once that thing went off, once something happened, it was a horrendous fire, and nothing was left when they, when they were done. It happened time after time. That's why we don't have records from a lot of the old, other old canoe builders uh, back, back in the day. We do have wonderful records from Old Town, and I'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, let's talk about the materials that go into a, a wood canvas canoe. The magical material that, that, was, that made the building of wood canvas canoes or cedar canvas canoes possible was cedar. It's, it's the perfect wood for canoe building. It's lightweight, it's naturally rot resistant, and most importantly, if you apply heat to it, it can be bent and it will adapt adapt to bending very, very nicely. It's the perfect wood for canoe building. And it's no, it's no surprise that the area of the country where these kind of canoes flourished and were developed is up in the northern latitudes of the U.S. and the southern latitudes of Canada, where northern white cedar grows, uh, you know, floriferates. Um, it became clear to the big builders, especially Old Town, that they were going to have to find a, another material for, especially for planking, because white cedar is naturally a very knotty uh, wood. Only about 1% of all the cedar cut in the world is suitable grade for canoe building. In Canada, they call it canoe grade cedar. It's literally called that. For canoe building, you need long, clear, straight-grained material. And cedar is much better suited for knotty cedar paneling on your den or something <laughs> like that. But anyway, so Old Town figured out that by bringing in train loads, car loads of western red cedar, they could use that to plank their canoes. Use white cedar for the ribs, that was the standard for Old Town from then on, and many, many other builders started doing the same thing. It was just a question of what, where you could get the materials you needed. That red canoe over there, for instance, has 
white cedar ribs, red cedar planking. That is the standard and it became the standard. Other key ingredients were ash and spruce and, and early uh, uh, birch a lot, especially for the rails, the long straight members up here, forts and seats. Um, and later cherry and mahogany became very popular. Mahogany got really hard to get during World War II, so you didn't see much of it after that. Of course, canvas had to be, had to be incorporated. There's nothing, nothing special about it. It's just cotton duck canvas, or whatever, it's, whatever the name of it is. There's absolutely nothing special about it. But the canvas by itself does not make the bolt waterproof. As you can imagine, if you had a fold like this and you put canvas on and put it in the water, the canvas would soak up and the thing would go right, right, right under water. So the important thing was to develop a, a product which we call filler that was worked into the canvas to make it waterproof and tough, abrasion resistant. And every builder developed their own formula for filler. Common ingredients were, were um, oil, linseed oil, paint, Japan dryer, um, silica, finely ground silica, and most of them used white lead as a uh, mold retardant. Um, it worked very well. The white lead killed a lot of canoe builders, <laughs> we know today, um, and nobody uses it today, so we've, we've learned other recipes. And then back in the day, every builder had their own recipe and they guarded them jealously and they all advertised that they had the best filler recipe and the only one that would stand up and it was a great, great marketing tool back and forth. And of course, varnish and paint finish, finish the boat. The other component of the material were all the different fasteners that go into a boat like this. The most important thing to know about them is that they had to be non-ferrous. They were brass, they were silicon bronze. Nobody used steel because they would rust and uh, didn't do the job anymore. The most important of those were the canoe tacks, and we're going to talk about that when we actually start building the canoe together here later tonight. So um, let's, let's start talking about the process of, of building a wood canvas canoe. If you decide you want to build one, and this is what I faced when I, some 20 some years ago, when I said I want, to, I want to build myself a canoe, I quickly learned that you can't just start building a canoe, you have to build a form first. And that's what this is down here. This is a, a wood canvas canoe building form. This one was built by, I don't know who, but it was donated to the Maritime Center. It was, built, you know? it was built in Fredonia. I don't know who the builder was though. Okay. Um, these things are heavy <laughs> and they, they have, you need a separate form for every design, every length, every style of canoe that you want to build. That you really can't, can't change that about the canoe. Um, they're very solid and they have to be very accurately built. If you have a form that's crooked this way, every canoe that you build on it is going to be like a NASCAR canoe, you know, it's only going to go left, <laughs> that, that kind of thing. Um, but once you had a good form, you could build a thousand canoes on that form. And in fact, there are form, building forms in use today that are over a hundred years old and they're still banging away on it. Um, the, the whole process of lofting a boat, drawing it, I always, I always wish people would draw the finished boat, but that they would loft the form because you'd have much better information to build the form from. And once the form is built, you don't need the lofting anymore because it's just, you're going to build whatever this tells you to build. <laughs> okay? So that's how that works. Um, the others, so you got to get yourself a building form. You've got to either make it yourself. We built one here at the Maritime Center, gosh, 10 years ago? Yeah. 15. 15 down on the NFTA building, down on Thurman yeah. Boulevard. We did two of them, I think. Hmm? I think we did two of them. We did one uh, years ago with Stelmach, I 
Okay, yeah. one before that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know where that one is. I wonder if that's it. That might be. Well, I don't know. But anyway, it's a, it's a major investment. It takes more time and effort to build a form and build it well than it does to build a canoe. But if you're going to do it, you better, you better do it well or you're never going to be happy with the canoes that come off of it. So getting ready to build a canoe then, you, you've got your form. I'm not going to go into the, to how it's built. It's just a very, very solid plug, if you will, over which we're going to mold this canoe, okay? Um, and it has these metal bands right where each one of the ribs go, which serve a very important purpose, which we'll get to in just a minute. You also have to prefabricate a number of pieces. Um, you have to prefabricate the stems, which is this piece right here. It's made out of ash or white oak. And bending this is the hardest bending part of the whole process. It's like bending a baseball bat. This is, this is ash, and this one didn't do so well. If you can see in there, it, it exploded when we tried to bend it. And that's why I never went any further with it. I think I get about four out of five successful bends when I do these. But the piece of wood has to be perfect, and even then you're going to break some, but it's pretty extreme. You also have to make the in whales, which are this, this lengthy piece right here, up here or down here. It runs the whole length of the canoe and defines basically the shear line of the canoe. They have to be uh, put into the canoe form before we can start. Now, I just spent a lot of time talking about cedar being the, the absolute magical, most important wood. You can't build a canoe without it, right? I, I must tell you that when we built this model, there is not a single piece of cedar in that. <laughs> <laughs> not a bit. And the reason is, when, I, when we, Eddie and I were sitting down to talk about building this thing, and I told him that we were going to have to invest five or six hundred dollars in cedar, <laughs> his jaw dropped, and we quickly figured out that downtown at the Seneca Chief in the, in the Long Shed was a whole lot of offcuts of cypress. Beautiful. Sapwood, basically. Beautiful, clear, long lengths of cypress. And he said, I wonder if we could build a canoe on cypress. So I took some back to my shop one day and did some experimental bending and was very pleased decide or discover that we could do this. And so we did. Every bit of this, let's see, ribs, planking, these are more, the decks, everything on here is... is um, With the exception of the seat and the stems, I think, right, are... Right, the stem. Yeah. Uh, they're cypress. Leftovers from the Seneca Chief. Which would have been firewood, I think, if we hadn't, <laughs> if we hadn't saved them. Um, so, just that disclaimer, but every other canoe I've ever built is cedar <laughs> or had in my shop. All right, let's walk through the actual construction process and um, uh, see if you can you know, follow along with us. Uh, we start with our building form, get it up on sawhorses or something to a comfortable building height. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take our pre-bent stem, which is like this, except not fractured, and it's bent to the, to the correct curve. There's a separate building form to do that on. We'll cut it in half, lengthwise split it, because we want two identical stems, one at this end and one at that end of the canoe. And we will do some other fabrication on it. This has to be beveled to receive the planking that's gonna come in from both sides, and it has to be notched. You can, a little bit, you can see a little bit down here, to allow these ribs to pass right through it. See how they go right through? If you get up close, you can see how they're notched. And then, that stem, I'm going to use this one, gets attached to the, to the building form at both ends and fits into this notch right here. And the grooves have to, the, the grooves have to line up right here. So that has to be secured to the form, get it in the right position, and then the in whales, the long backbone of the canoe here, of the, of the dome, 
has to be attached with clamps down the full length of the boat on both sides. And that, that's down here, right, right under this where the metal bands terminate. And that's held in place with clamps. And now you're pretty much ready to go to the next step. This, this is called a strong pack. It's a, it's a two by four in this case that is affixed to the building form and just up about a half an inch. And it's very important in the next step, which is bending the ribs onto the boat. Now, there's about 50 ribs, 45, 50 ribs on a boat like this. They're usually made of cedar, except in this case. Here's a, here's a typical rib. They're, they come in different lengths because the ones in the middle of the canoe are longer than the ones at either end. They're uh, about two and a quarter inches wide, five sixteenths inch thick is the building standard. We made these a little smaller because the, uh, the uh, cypress is so much stronger than the cedar and we wanted to make sure we could bend it. You gotta fabricate all these out of rough cedar boards. So there's a lot of time at the table saw and the sanding <coughs> and the planer. They've got rounded edges and they're beveled. I don't know if you can see the bevel on here and here, but they're it helps take a little bit of weight off by getting that off and it keeps the strong part of the rib in the parts of the canoe where you need the strength, but not where you don't. So, on rib bending day, we, the day before we soak all these ribs in water, and on rib bending day we get a crew of people together and we have that. We get the steamer set up and we steam these ribs for about 15-20 minutes each we get a cycle going so that there's more coming along. And it's generally easiest to do this with, with two people, one on either side of the form. And you take this, this rib and you slide it through under the strong back, and then the people on both sides force it down and around. You're molding it right to the form now, right to the right along these metal bands, and it gets it gets secured. <laughs> Best to show you right over here. It gets secured to the in whale with two silicon bronze ring shank nails right here. Okay, this, this is upside down. When we're doing this, this is turned upside down and sitting on top of the form. And we, we ribbed this whole thing out in about an hour and a half with three or four of us working. When I do it by myself, it's, it's three or four hours. But you have to steam these ribs. They will bend very nicely. They'll conform to the shape of the form. And you can get them nailed in. And that's the beginning of the, the, the backbone of the, the, the shape of the, of the, of the canoe. Um, so, uh, once they get a chance to dry and set up a little bit, we got to sand them, fair them one to another, take off any edges that are up a little higher because we want the planking to lay nice and smooth along them. Um, it's not unlike um, fairing the ribs on the, on the Seneca cheek. It's the same, the same idea. And then the next step basically is to get into planking. And that's putting the exterior skin on the boat. This is a piece of cedar planking that I brought in. The favored type of planking uh, is quarter sawn material with the, you can see the grain lines running, you know, parallel to the length of the board. Quarter sawn lumber moves this way much less than plain sawn lumber so that when the, the planks are laid out and next to each other, we get far fewer gaps later as the wood expands and contracts. And the whole process here is to start um, start laying this planking perpendicular. I'm going to just lay it down here, perpendicular to the ribs, starting at the center line of the, the boat. Remember, the boat's upside down here. Starting with the garboard planks, which is the same name you would use in any other boat building, and working our way down and around the turn of the bilge. Planking is is the part of the, of the boat that I, I think of the canoe building that is the most uh, 
the most artful or the most requires the most craftsmanship because these planks um, never stay <laughs> never stay straight like they are when they're manufactured. In fact, almost every plank has to be tapered and custom fitted to the plank next to it because as you as you start building in the middle of the boat here, the boat is, is much bigger in circumference than it is when you get down to this end of the boat. And so everything has to taper and fit together. You can see the taper in the finished boat. You can see the taper, if you look carefully on, on our model here, you see how the, the full width there and they're starting to taper here. You, you can really see them going the other way. That's, that's what takes a lot of time in the planking process, but it's what really makes the boat look, look nice from the inside when you get all done. Now, how do you install the planking? This is where the canoe tacks come into play, and this, is, this was the, the, thing, the biggest, most important development in the building of wood canvas canoes that differentiated them from the bark canoes. The white the white men, the old town people, and the chestnut people figured out that you could drive a brass tack. In, Eddie, can we show that yeah. picture? And, and have it clinch. It goes through the planking, through the rib, and then it clinches, it turns against this metal band on the form. So but this is, if this is if this is the planking, and this is the thickness of the rib, and this is the solid building form with the metal band on it, here's the tack, just as you start driving it down through the planking and through the rib. When it hits that metal form, it literally turns like a fish hook. And as you continue to drive it, it, it works its way back into the rib. And when you're done, you have effectively a rib because you have a head on the top and you have a hook on the bottom. And that, that just isn't going to come apart. I have taken apart 100-year-old canoes to do restorations on them, and those tacks, those are clinched just as well as they were when they were first driven. It's, it's a miracle, a miracle connection detail. The round head on the tack also allows you to drive it down just below the surface of the woods so, so that you don't have the head of the tack sitting proud and making little little dimples on your on your surface all the time. So there's about 2,500 of these on a typical 60 foot canoe. This one would have had more. They're all driven by hand. It's a it's a labor intensive process, but it's it's what makes this process work. It's the key the key ingredient. Okay, so as you get Partway through the planking to about here, now remember you're starting down here, it's time to take the boat off the form. If you go much further, pretty soon the, the, the thing, the, the, the canoe itself, you won't be able to get it off the form. Okay? So when it gets to about here, we loosen up our clamps and everything and spread it a little bit and we literally lift the canoe skeleton off the form, put the form away set this up on our, on our saw horses or whatever, just like this, or actually upside down. And uh, first thing we have to do is draw it together because as you might imagine, all these ribs want to go, mm, right? So we draw it together with straps or we made some uh, pieces like this with notches that you know just fit right across from rail to rail. They work very well. And the next thing to do is, is, is to get the two in whales to join together to the tip of the stem and to find this end of the canoe, get a little piece of a deck, it's like a triangle, fabricated and put in there. It really works not so much like a deck as a gusset plate to strengthen the end of the canoe. And then it's time to finish planking the canoe. Except now we don't have a building form and we don't have the metal straps to clinch the nails. So what we turn to next is the clinching iron. And that's what this is. It's a cast iron 
or bronze, other ones, specially made for this process. It's got lots of different curves on it so that you can line it up against any portion of the curve of the hull. And when you go to drive these tacks in, you, you put this against the inside of the rib and drive it in. And the mass of this keeps the boat from vibrating. And it, when the tack hits this surface, it turns it just like that. So that part is done a little more slowly, but nonetheless, it's very effective. So we get the boat pretty much planked up. And if we're working our way down the model here, here's, here's the, you know, the bare skeleton of the ribs with, attached to the in-whales, the stem piece initially put on the form. Planking has now been completed. You cut off the tips of the ribs here, flush with the, uh, the top of the in-whale. And after a, fair, a, a lot of sanding and fairing and smoothing, making sure this surface is smooth, it's time to put the canvas on the boat. So we take a, a roll of our canvas that's 60 inches wide. That's the, way, that's the way it comes, and that'll fit around almost any canoe. We couldn't do the normal type of canvassing in this boat because we're only canvassing from here back. <laughs> but in a normal canoe, you, you, you take this big, long piece of canvas, and it's one piece. And you fold it in half lengthwise, like a, and you set it up like a hammock. And you get a big clamp on both ends. And you attach one end to like a post like this and the other end to another post and you have a come along in there and you are able to pull that canvas tight as a drum and then you can let it off a little bit and literally drop the canoe into that hammer and you either have to put a lot of weight in the boat or brace it off the ceiling to hold it down because when you retighten that thing the canvas wants to push the canoe right out right out through the top so you, you, have one, you either have to brace it, as in my shop, my ceilings are only eight feet. So I brace off the ceiling, hold it down, and you begin to stretch that canvas around the, the wooden part of the canoe. And believe it or not, this stuff will stretch. It's, it's amazing. When you, you pick it up, you don't really feel it. But when you put enough tension on it, you can see it stretch, and it's, and it's elastic when you when you let it go, it'll try to spring back again. In fact, you can see what happens here when we, when we were tacking this in and we pulled it this way and we tacked it at the top of the rib and then let go of it. You see the little eyebrows that form right there? That means the canvas is pulling, pulling back. Now that's what you want to see. That tells you that the canvas is tight this way and it's tight this way. A lot of, a lot of, uh, techniques involved with getting it done just right, especially when you get down to the end. But what's important is that's one piece of canvas. It's not adhered to the hull. It's only fastened to the hull along the, along the shear line and at the stems. And when we get down here, we have to slit it like this and wrap one end around and tack it in here, and then wrap the other end around and tack it in there. So that gets the canvas on the boat, and um, oh, I forget in here. Is the it next, dry when it goes on? It's dry, right? Yeah. Some people have talked about getting it wet and, and shrinking it on, but nobody really does it that way. It's better to physically stretch it and get it tight, and tack it on. So next we have to waterproof the boat. And in, in effect, the canvas is a matrix for the filler. That's the way to think about what's going on here. The canvas itself doesn't do anything to waterproof the boat or make it stronger. It's really just a matrix to hold the filler, which, which when it's covered by the paint and everything, is the working, waterproofing, abrasion-resistant layer of the boat. So, this, uh, the traditional fillers that I talked about earlier with the lead in them and the linseed oil in them and everything, they take about six weeks to dry. And it, it has, it's, it's drying by evaporation. There's no chemical process, not an epoxy or a, anything like that. It just takes a long time for all the oils to evaporate off. We, we didn't have six weeks, so we went with a, 
a more modern uh, latex product that's actually just Zen Sears one two three primer, yeah. which is a common product you buy at Home Depot. You get enough layers of it on it, it does a pretty good job. And we, we put it all on in one day. Yeah, it dries really fast. It dries really fast. It dries so fast you can't get it all on a lot of just brush <laughs> periodically. Um, and once you've got the whole boat filled, it's time to start the process of um, thinking about getting paint on the boat. Um, and that, that involves sanding, priming, sanding, priming, painting, priming, painting, <laughs> or uh, painting, sanding, painting, sanding. And so usually it's, it's several layers of primer and, and three, four, or five layers of paint, whatever, you know, now you're doing it to what you like. It's not unlike automotive work at that point, trying to build it up and sand it smooth. Uh, um, and that's, that's, you know, the, the painting and the coloring process. And of course, some canoes have fancy designs on them and everything else. The other important piece that uh, has to be put on the boat after you get some paint on first, uh, is the outwell, and that's this. You want to give me the other section? So, we, we leave the canvas after we're done here, while we're putting on the, the fill, we leave a little skirt of this to protect, protect the woodwork on the inside. We can trim that all off flush, and it's time to put on the outwell, which together with the inwell makes up the gunnels, if you will, of the boat. And they're screwed on every other rib, with uh, number eight inch and a half silicon bronze screws. And together, the in and the out -wheel makes a very strong, very strong uh, unit to help keep the boat in shape. It also provides the, 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 the place to attach the ports, which come across the boat, and the seats, uh, which we won't, we won't get into that. It's pretty self-explanatory there. Cane seats are the standard these things. Um, but these, of course, the ports are very important to keep the boat from spreading. And you can have carry ports and you can have yokes for, for portaging and everything else. This is, um, there's my little pointer. This is how this, this whole in whale, out whale joint looks. If this is the in whale, and you, it usually has a taper down one side to allow for some tumble home in the side of the boat. Many designs have that. Here's the rib coming up and being nailed into the uh, in whale, and then the planking goes on over that, and it's cut off. It's cut off like you can see right here, just below the, the top of the ribs and the in whale, because when we go to put the out whale on, it's it's cut out so that this little piece right here covers the top of the planking and uh, the canvas, which is right here, and it gets screwed right in there. It makes a very strong, very strong unit. And then you can come along with a belt sander and sand the top of the in whale, the out whale, and then get a nice smooth joint here along the ribs. Varnishing takes place, uh, you know, as early as you can. It's usually better to varnish the inside of the boat before you start painting it. I like to do it that way. And the very last thing that you do is to put on a stem band or a bang plate or whatever you want to call it. This one's aluminum because I had one in my shop, but it's, they're often commonly made out of brass and it gives you something so that when you crash into a rock or a dock or something, you're hitting metal, not wood and canvas. And you, you will do that sooner or later. So that is very quick. A very quick, almost superficial tour of how one of these things goes together. Eddie had such a great idea of building this model because if you literally go from right, your right to left, you can follow the whole process from, from the very beginning of bending ribs on all the way to the finished canoe. Now, before I answer any questions, I just want to say two things. One, Anybody who wants to learn more about this should borrow this book from Eddie in the library. It's called <laughs> The Wood Canvas Canoe, the, written by Jerry Stelmach and Ronald Burlow. 
who are like <laughs> the gods the of wood canvas canoe building <laughs> um, in Maine. Um, it, it talks about everything I've talked about tonight, and this is what I read first. And I've read a number of other books, but I've probably read this ten times and gone back to it and referenced different things. I'd encourage it's still in print if somebody wants to, if wants to buy it. The other thing I want to touch on for just a minute before we get in, into questions is the whole process of restoration and repairs. And if you want to hit that on for me. One of the beauties of a canoe like this is that it is easily repaired or restored. <coughs> and the process of doing that is, is most simply described as deconstructing the boat in exactly the order, reverse order of what I just talked about, until you get down to the wooden parts that are broken, broken ribs, a punctured planking, a cracked in whale, you name it. Broken or rotted, which happens. Replacing, once you get down to that, replacing it, make a new one, put it in, and then recon reconstruct the canoe, just like you were building a new one, okay? So that's the very simplest way I talk about it, but the, the point is it can be done. There's nothing you can do to this canoe that can't be restored or rebuilt. You can't say that about a synthetic canoe or a graphite canoe. It won't be the same if you punch, you know, you punch a hole through it. It'll never be the same. This will look exactly the way it does. In fact, that, that canoe has been restored. Others are on here have been Restored as well, and oftentimes they're better after the restoration than they were when they were brand new. So that's one of the sort of hidden things about this kind of a canoe that most people don't recognize. Um, all right, I'm running out of uh, voice. Let's let's, let's talk uh, yeah. questions. I mean, talking about restoration, we, we restored that canoe. Uh, it was it used to be called Buzz? It came from uh, it came from uh, Chautauqua Lake. Uh, but I remember the, the hardest part about we had to re restore, replace some ribs, yeah. and not having the the frame, we had to bend the ribs and squeeze them down and slide them across underneath. Yeah, uh, that was a bit of a challenge. We we broke a number of them, but it so, was doable once you once well, you get it in. Here's the way you do that. Let's say this rib right here is broken. Yeah. Pick a rib, and <laughs> and you know it's cracked. It's Demolished, and usually it isn't just one, it's two or three in a row where yeah. somebody really cracked it against something. Yeah. But let's just say it's this rib. And you, you get the canvas off, and you, you know, you get down to the point where you can get at this rib. Yeah. And, you, and you take it out and you say, now i got to make a new rib. Yeah. The, the slickest way to do it is to use the canoe as a form, but you can't do it right where this rib is. You have to go to a narrower do it on the outside. Do it on the outside. So yeah. for this rib, I'd probably bend yeah. the new rib on the outside of the canoe one rib over. Yeah. Over. If I were here, I might have to go two or three ribs over to get to get the right diameter, sort yeah. of when yeah. you push it. But you're absolutely right. It, it's a little tricky sometimes to get them in there, but it's doable. Yeah. And that new rib will work just as well as yeah. as the old one. Another thing, I and just from the, this restoration. That I did uh, the, the sections where, where the the, 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 uh, the actually the planking was broken. Uh, you didn't have to replace a large plank. If you just went from one one frame to the next, you could slip it in. At least that's right. the way I did. I don't know if that's no. That's that absolutely the way to do it. You 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 find where the where the uh, hole was, or you know you puncture or whatever it is, yeah. and you can once you got the canvas off, you can you can cut the. I know, it's a let's mat see. knife. Oh, I'm not show this. Let's do it this way. Let's say, let's say this plank, or this plank right here had a huge hole in it right here. You don't replace this whole plank. If this is where the hole is, you go a couple ribs over here and a couple ribs over here, and you just replace that piece. Yeah. And, and on the inside, if you get the colors right, you'll, you'll never know. Yeah. yeah. And it'll be just as strong. Even on new canoes, the planks don't run the whole length of the canoe. You can yeah. see the joints here, yeah. where we've scarfed and, and butted joints, done different things. Do you 
need to read Candace then? Oh yeah. The whole thing. Well, if you're gonna if you're gonna get into structural repairs of ribs and planking, you gotta get the plank, you gotta get the canvas on. And to do that, you have to take the keel off. If there's a keel on the bottom, of the boat, you gotta take the outwheel off. You gotta take the stem band off. But they all go right back on again, unless they're broken. The, the weirdest, <laughs> the weirdest case I ever had to deal with was a canoe like this. The guy brought to my shop. And there was a hole about the size of a baseball, right there, and right out the other side. <laughs> and it went right through, like a cannonball. <laughs> and he would never tell me. <laughs> he never told me. <laughs> the other one, that, the other one that was really a mess was it had a hole about about that big, right, right about there, right in the bottom of the boat. And he did tell me what happened. He, it was his wife's canoe. And he was trying to get it down off of, it was hung up in the garage, and he dropped it. And it hit the ball on the hitch in the back of his car and punched a hole right, perfectly round hole right there. <laughs> and he brought me that canoe and said, can you fix it, can you fix it? I said, well, you know, I can patch it. He said, just don't tell my wife. <laughs> I don't know if you ever told her or not. <laughs> When you say patch, can you just cut a section of the canvas off? Does any restoration you use can. all the canvas if, on? If you have a, a canoe where the canvas <coughs> is damaged but the structure behind it is not damaged, you can um, you can splice in a piece of canvas and, and you know see over seam a tear or, or a cut or whatever. You don't have to replace the canvas for just a small tear. Okay. What I'm talking about are, are the right, our restoration structural repairs where there's serious damage to the structure. And that's what you would do if you're out in the bush and you puncture, you scratch the hole in your canvas. You'd have a kit with some pieces of canvas and some glue and some duct tape and whatever you get it done. It's doable. It's totally doable. Huh. Jack? Um, over time, we're going to It's not stored properly. Any wooden boat, if you know, can get hog. Does everybody know what that means? You know where it's. Well, if uh, the ends drop, the ends droop. Uh, well, it's the other way. It's where the middle is. The middle sags down. It's, that's the problem. Okay. Um, if you if you took a boat like this and supported it way at the two ends. And just let it sit there. Eventually, gravity would, would push the middle down, and the thing would be hog. Okay. Now, how would you deal with that in the restoration? Well, you, first of all, it shouldn't be stored that way. It should be supported at the quarter points and, and kept dry and, and things like that. I have heard of, uh, I've never done this, but I've heard of, of people taking a whole canoe like this and getting it up on a uh, sawhorses or something, wrapping the whole canoe in heavy plastic, like uh, shrink wrap, and injecting up inside of it the steam exhaust from a steam generator, and essentially steaming the whole canoe to death. <laughs> a relaxed canoe. And, 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 in, in the rest, and in the meantime, you have to have a series of strong members in, in the shape that you want it to go to. So you're essentially reshaping the boat all at once using steam. I've, I've read about it, I've never seen it done, I never want to try it myself. <laughs> and the other way I've heard of doing that is literally sinking the canoe underwater until it's saturated with water. You get rid of, you take the canvas off and everything else, and then try to do it. And, you, and of course you have to over uh, overshape it because it's going to spring back. Yeah. So I've heard of that, but I've, I've never done it myself. And so you do have keels on it? Oh yeah, a lot, most of the canoes I've built this on. Yeah, that one has a keel on it too. There's a big debate about keels on canoes. Some people like them.
Some people think it'll help the canoe stra uh, track straighter. Some people don't want a canoe because they want to be able to side slip it more easily, especially in white water. It's an option for all the canoes I build. It's an option. You can have it or not have it. Yes? If you're doing a Dutchman repair on your planks, you said you usually use uh, five or six ribs, at least that wide. If I have a, if I have a busted plank, I, if, if, if I have a hole right here, yeah. I wouldn't just cut out a piece like that. I, I'd go at least two ribs in each direction so that you had a chance to get that nice and fair and it, and it would blend in with the other pieces around it. So when you do your cutout, you cut out uh, halfway? Yeah, you find the middle of the rib. The middle of the rib. Yeah, and cut it with a utility knife. Yeah. Sometimes you cut it on a bias like a scarf joint, and, and the same thing down here, and then fabricate a new piece, yeah. and put it in, and retack it, use the clinching iron to back it up. Like on a bigger boat, you would use butt blocks, but on a canoe Yeah, boat, you butt blocks on a big boat, the same. But up here, you're always, you're always working on a rib. Yeah, and they're wide enough. Uh, the ribs, yeah, well, they're wide enough. You to can get your butt behind the rib. Yeah, okay. well, you don't need them, because Buck block would go between the ribs, yeah. but you don't need it if you use a long enough piece because it'll, yeah. it'll span like, a, like an original piece. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Would you use this material again? Pardon? Would you use this material again that you used for this? Uh, the, the, uh, the plus in this case was we had an unlimited supply of really nice <laughs> material. Free. Um, it's heavier than cedar. It's harder than cedar. Uh, we compensated for that by thinning down the ribs and thinning down the planking. Um, it's brittle a little bit and you get splinters <laughs> all the time. Man, we had splinters in our hands all the time. So I don't think it'll ever replace cedar. Um, cedar is truly the magic wood for yeah, if you had to buy it at the same price as Western Red, you might as well go with Western Red. Yeah, yeah. You ever use spruce? We, we did it. I mean, it, it, worked, it worked real well. No, you ever use spruce? Uh, uh, there have been uh, boats built that way. Uh, I've never used it. I've, I've heard about people doing that. Um, it doesn't bend very well. No. Spruce is son of a bitch to bend it. It also doesn't want to bend it. It'll crack before it bends. It's like bending mahogany. Really hard to bend it. But cedar will just bend like ash or cherry, it'll bend beautifully. Well, there's a number of ways to do that. Um, usually, the ones you're removing are in a damaged section of the canoe that you're going to replace anyway. So you just get in there with a pack puller sort of a thing, get under the head and pry them out. If you really have to be careful for some reason, what, what you're seeing here is these little dots, little brass dots. These, these are the rounded, the heads, uh, the rounded parts of the clinch. They're not the ends of the tack, they're the rounded parts. And if you can, yeah, they're what you see in this picture here in the boat is this, that little point right there. And that's what you see in the canoe. If you can get at that and pry it, pry it up a little bit and either cut this or straighten this, you can slide the tack right out. It's very labor intensive and hard to do. I usually just get a hold of the tack and yank it out because the pieces pieces that I'm going to replace, I don't care about. They're going to, you know, if I damage them, it's okay, I'm going to cut them out anyway. But yes, you can take them out and put in new tacks. That's, that's what you do. Question over here? Somebody Same here. one. <laughs> what form did you use for this boat? This one? Yeah. This one. Okay. Yeah, this came right off of here. Uh, as I said earlier, we had to do some, some work to this once we got a good look at it. Uh, we found some shortcomings to it that uh, we had to fix before we tried to build a boat. And, and uh, for instance, these 
metal bands are not well attached, they're not tight. And that led to a lot of these, a lot of these canoe tacks that weren't clinched completely or properly. We had to go back and hit almost every one of them again with, with the iron behind it. And that would bend there really nicely. So, so this is all going to be part of Eddie's beautiful upcoming exhibit. Yes, yes. And this, I think, tells the story pretty well um, of how these boats are built. And I hope everybody will take the opportunity to come to the open house, right? Yeah. Coming up on... So there's a uh, <clears throat> there's an opening for Maritime Center members on uh, May uh, Thursday, May 18th from 6 to 8. And then on Friday, the next day, there's an opening to uh, the public on Friday. Um, uh, we're look at the exhibit, and there will also be tours of uh, the rest of the Maritime Center woodshop, the boundary, the uh, classroom, and the library upstairs. Um, and, and that is the, uh, the information for the, the opening. Um, yeah, and it, and, it, and it follows a lot of what Lou had talked about through the, uh, the origin in dugout canoes, um, through Birch bark canoes, lap straight canoes, kind of the, the resurgence, or not the resurgence, but the, the transition of canoes from kind of being work boats and uh, for hunting and fishing, kind of in the uh, 1860s, kind of transitioning to being uh, recreation boats, and then into the 20th century up until um, today. And an interesting note about the, uh, the Grumman aluminum canoe. Uh, there was a, the, it was a vice president for the Grumman Aircraft Company was on a canoe trip in El in, in the Adirondacks and had a waterlogged, poorly built uh, uh, wood canvas canoe. He's like, I bet you can make one out of one of these out of aluminum. <laughs> that probably how it happened. Yeah. <laughs> can go back to that build record. I oh yeah. Just say one more thing. <clears throat> Talk about restorations. And, how, and I said earlier about how most canoe shops, when they burn, all the records were lost. Um, we were very fortunate. I belong to a, a group called the Whitney Canoe Heritage Association. And about 20 some years ago, we were able to get together with you know, Old Town at the time. And we were able to scan and, and log all of the build records for every canoe going back to the early, early 1900s that they had ever built. And they were paper records, and they looked like this. And this, this is in fact one. Um, we, we can now search them, you know, electronically, and they're preserved forever. So if if you have an old town canoe that you bring me, and we find a serial number which is stamped in the stem right down in there, and I, I know there's one you in can there, see it. and I can I can go up to that number right there, and we can look up that canoe. And this, this will tell us when it was shipped from Old Town, who it was shipped to, and it will give us the history of when this canoe was built. For instance, this, this particular one was started on the form on December 17th, and it was taken off the form on the 19th. That's how fast these guys were doing this. I mean, it took us, it takes me months to get one off of the form. And then it was varnished in canvas, look at just days later. And then there was a waiting period while the filler cured, the keel was put on, and then it went back in here where the rails were put on, and the varnishing was done, and coloring, and da 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 And some of these, this, this one was fairly quick, but some of them are amazingly quick, quick where they, they, they were turning these things out. Uh, and, and this is actually the name of the guy who did it, who did the second varnishing. I, I, don't, I don't recognize that name, but a lot of these have names of the guys from the plant who did the work. And we know that, that this canoe was 16 feet. It was, great. well, that's the common, uh, oh, CS, Common Sense. That was Old Tom's short name for the, the base level canoe. It was a Yankee model, which was, uh, I think this is an Octa, and later that was renamed the Yankee. The 
hiking was western cedar, red cedar. The gunnels were spruce in an open style like this. The decks and seats and forts were ash, and it had a keel. It did not have these other things, and it was painted originally dark green. So if, if you're doing a restoration of a canoe, this is really good information to have, because if the canoe has been worked on before, who knows all the changes that have been made. If I know this, I can restore the canoe back to its original for a long time, you could actually give them a, a frame number, yep. and they would send you a replacement frame in the mail. Yep. <laughs> that was up until fairly recently. Yeah. I'm sure they didn't make much money on that. Mm. <laughs> that red canoe that. was originally green. That was uh, yep. that was, uh, yeah. And he got the cheap paint job I instead of the. I green. read somewhere. It's interesting. Um, this wooden canoe heritage association. That I belong to. One of the members, is, is, his name is Benson Gray, and he's the great grandson of the founder of, of the Old Town of Canoe Company, which was the Gray family. Yeah, yeah. And so he has an unimaginable, an unbelievable collection of Old Town canoes and Old Town canoe memorabilia, and he knows everything yeah, yeah. about Old Town canoes. And he told me once that 80% of all the canoes Old Towns produced were dark green. <laughs> It's like the Model A, you know, the yeah. Model T. Yeah. Black, <laughs> any color you want. Black, black. Want, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Any color right. Right. black. And so green was definitely the, the most popular color, followed closely by red, I'm sure, but, yeah. but uh, green, was, green was the one. And if anyone wants an example of a closed gunnel, uh, the yeah. boat up here on the right, which is also Cedar Canvas, has a closed gunnel. Now there's a restoration <laughs> thing. <right? laughs> well, no, well, we thought about that when we picked that up. This, this was supposedly supposedly, uh, in the Pan American exhibition. Closed gunnels, that would make sense before uh, 1903 and so forth. Uh, but um, we, we, we said if we ever have to sell it, it was in the Pan American exhibition. If we're going to keep it, we have our doubts. But uh, <laughs> so the paint job, also, BD, BD there. That was a, something else about that canoe that you might find interesting. It has these long decks. You know, those are probably... 30 some inch long decks. Yeah. They're not there for any structural reason. They're purely aesthetic. And this this is this is not a full-on cording canoe, but it's getting there. They used to put really long decks on canoes so that the cockpit was only about four, four or six feet. Yeah. And when the recreational canoeing craze hit, they were they literally were called courting canoes because a guy would get his best girlfriend and they'd get out in this and he'd be paddling and she'd be facing him and they they could only be they couldn't get very far apart <laughs> and back in the day it, you know it, to get that close to, candy to candy each other liquor is quicker right and they'd be out and even room for the uh, ukulele exactly the ukulele or the wind up victrola. Yeah. You know, places like the Charles River in Boston, there are photographs of thousands, thousands of canoes on a Sunday afternoon. And they were livery canoes, and there were huge livery places where you could rent these gorgeous canoes. And my grandparents said their first date in a canoe on yeah. the right. Seneca River. And look where that got us. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's really what those long decks are all about, yeah. other than just, you know, they're sort of sexy looking for, yeah. for some canoes. Structurally, they're not. And then the pseudo creative. Indian designs in there too, which are, right, right, it kind of is reminiscent of the of the big uh, stems of birch bark canoes. And a canoe like that that's been painted on the inside is just an For impossible sure. job. Yeah, I, I just think that. to get rid of that paint is it's just impossible. Yeah. We used to rent canoes at the uh, hotel in Oak Creek. Oh yeah. Park. In fact, in fact, you have we do. Yeah. You have a Carlton canoe in Cold Storage yeah. down in down in the way yeah, yeah. that came from uh, Delaware Park. Yeah, it yeah, was, yeah. It was yeah. a Carlton canoe and it was a yeah. livery canoe on on Point Lake. And that was in there. I think that they was out in nineteen forty something. When yeah. They it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it went up in someone's garage and then it was uh, delivered to us. Yeah. yeah. That will be one worth restoring because there's a yeah. story. Story to tell. We're going to always have that next to a canoe that was fully restored. Yeah. But, uh, well, yeah. And I don't know if you remember, you were around, then, uh, 
somebody dropped off a canoe like a like a fondling at our doorstep one time. You know, they knew we were working on boats, and here's this green canoe just battered to death. And sure enough, we took it inside. <laughs> I, I don't know where it is now, uh, but uh, but it had some repairs on it that were just ingenious. And they'd taken tin cans and they'd pound the tin can in there with tar underneath it. I mean, just you know, anything they could do to plug well, the if hole. If you're on a camping trip and you punch yeah. a hole in the bottom of your canoe and yeah. you have a can of beans for dinner, yeah. you can clean out and cut that tin and force it under the edges of the ribs yeah. and stick it in there with baked beans if you want. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever, yeah. pine sap, and yeah. it'll plug the leak yeah. until you yeah. get back to camp. And get you home alive. That's that. Yeah. Duct tape works good too. Yeah. Bubble gum. Bubble gum. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you all. Thank you. Keep track of uh, Eddie's notes here and come and see the open house and then encourage your yeah. friends and neighbors to come to the actual exhibit. It's going to be beautiful. I mean, yes. Yeah. All, all the boats in here. Um, yeah. So, Lou, thank you so much for uh, coming to speak with us for uh, to speak, uh, uh, speaker series. And thank you everyone for attending. Uh, I, as Lou said, I mean, Lou's the expert here, but you guys should all come to the uh, to the exhibit when it opens in uh, May 18th and 19th. Um, and we up for a while, right? I mean, it'll, 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 <laughs> but not too long, not too long. <laughs> um, and we are gonna uh, open the uh, gift shop up for a little bit if anyone looking around. There's a beautiful model of the SS Greater Buffalo. Uh, SS Greater Buffalo. Um, which is a steamer that went between Buffalo and uh, Detroit, if you'll believe it. Um, uh, it's a very large model. Um, it was later converted into a uh, training ship aircraft, uh, carrier. aircraft carrier. Um, they put a deck on the top to you. Wow. George W. Bush, George, C Bush, George Bush Sr. learned to fly on that. Really? Look at that guy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So well, awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening. We can. I guess we more.